All right, to continue, I, I finally produced the image I tried to show you in the previous video. And as I started to say uh, at that time, Van Gogh followed the example of his compatriot Rembrandt containing a large number of self portraits, uh, about 50 or 60 in total. Now, this was no doubt in, in large part due to his strained finances. He could not afford to pay a model or could not get a model to agree to sit for him. He could always paint himself. And so um, I'll, I'll show you just one of uh, his self portraits. This is probably the most famous. It was done uh, while he uh, resided in an, an asylum, in the same asylum uh, in 1889. He was there for about a year. Uh, and you can see uh, that, um, um, that we, we find here in a subtle way an entire painting that's based on a, uh, a juxtaposition of complementary or opposite colors with a silvery blue set against the orangish color of his beard, of his hair, of his eyebrows. Uh, you can see blue even added to the shadows of his cheeks and his ears. Um, the whole painting really based on structure around that, uh, that juxtaposition. The drawing of this self-portrait, I think, is really quite fine. Um, interestingly, he spilled not only his coat, or what one would expect to find um, creases, uh, and yet here the creases take a, a curved form, um, but the entire background with uh, swirling, uh, gyrating shapes. Uh, and um, while this has a, a decorative um, effect, I think it also, perhaps, we may read it symbolically, um, though I, I, I don't know if it's something he intended, uh, it, it suggests the, the, uh, the, the, the instability, the turbulence, the inner turbulence that he was experiencing during this time. And it's, it's curiously juxtaposed with the rather firmly set facial expression. The two seem really quite different. Um, interesting, you know, in, in, in a, um, um, though, in, in, their, in, their, um, in their contrast with one another. All right, back to Arl. I want to hear talk about a painting that's one of his most famous. It's located uh, in the collection of Yale University. Um, it's in the United States. That is the Night Cafe. Now, what is a night cafe? Uh, in small towns like Arles, it was a cafe that stayed open all night. And it was a, a place that people knew they could go to, to, to sleep if they had nowhere else to go or to sleep off drunkenness. And so we see what Van Gogh labeled little drunken hooligans, little sleeping hooligans on uh, the tables here, in, in the, in the, one in the foreground on the right-hand side, one further in the distance on the left-hand side. Beyond him, there's a pair, a pair of a lovers, male, female couple sitting close together. We can tell uh, from the clock that it is 12.10 at night. And we see otherwise the contents of the night cafe. Uh, pool table in the center, the proprietor that uh, ran the place standing in the center, what looks like a lab coat, his, his white coat. Um, and gas lamps emanating light and kind of goldish hue, uh, lots of different green colors. Now, now Van Gogh wrote about this in his many letters to his brother, and these these passages are quoted in your textbook. I'm just going to read a couple of them. He says, "I have tried to express the terrible passions of humanity by means of red and green. These opposite complementary colors, red and green." And he goes on to describe. The room is blood red and dark yellow with a green billiard table. There are four citron yellow lamps with a glow of orange and green. Everywhere there's a clash and contrast of the most disparate reds and green. So um, the, the, the painting had a, had, a, had a plan regarding its color. Uh, he wanted to convey conflict, um, disparateness, disjunction. Uh, and he's used, uh, particularly in the red, uh, vivid, intensely colored um, red walls in order to uh, contrast with the greens that we see throughout in the ceiling. Notice in the hair of the proprietor, in the tables, in the bar in the back, the pool table, and so on. 
the uh, perspective here, in addition, seems, um, seems squeezed. It seems like the floor rises up very steeply and the room gets smaller in a kind of precipitous way. So one might say that the perspective is exaggerated. The pool table seems so steeply pitched it might slide off. Notice that there is a red ball and the red shadows on the white balls against the green table. So there, here too is that complementary contrast. And the brushwork here is very coarse. We can see how he's dragged the brush uh, loaded with yellow paint against underlying colors. So in perspective and brushwork, but especially in color, Van Gogh has tried to convey uh, a, a quality of emotion to elicit an emotional response from his viewer. He said that about this place, it was a place where one could go mad, commit a crime, ruin oneself. So clearly he had negative views of this place that aroused uh, negative emotional responses in him. And he wanted to convey that to his viewer. We might label this expressive naturalism. While it, it represents people and furniture and the setting in a way that seems plausible, uh, yet the things are exaggerated. Things are, are intensified with the aim of, of expressing an underlying feeling, an underlying idea. Uh, upon uh, having this breakdown in, um, in Arl, in the town of Arl, um, initially Van Gogh thought and hoped that that would be it. He would get better and he would go back to his life of painting all the time. Uh, but uh, there were subsequent breakdowns. These were unpredictable. He didn't know when they might happen, where he might be, if there would be someone around to help him. And so he uh, voluntarily entered an asylum for the insane, which is located about 15 miles away from Arles in the town of San Remy. Uh, and after being there a short while, he was allowed to paint. And then he was allowed to paint out of doors, always with a custodian in his company. So he might spend most of the day wandering around the countryside, uh, painting somewhere, and a custodian would be nearby, maybe taking a nap while he painted. It, uh, it was in San Remy where he painted one of his most famous works, The Starry Night. But I want to show you that the work followed a couple earlier efforts to paint stars in the night sky. And so here we see the uh, cafe terrace at night where the, star, the motif of the starry sky occupies a small part of the painting. Uh, and so against the darkness of the town, which was not lit by artificial lamps, by gas lamps in, at night, the cafe terrace is really an inviting, warm, uh, an engaging place to be. Here, a second effort. This is called the Starry Sky Over the Rhone. So this is the river that passes Arl. And in the foreground, we have a couple lovers out for a walk at night. And the Big Dipper is clearly visible here in the sky, as well as other stars that gleam against their dark surroundings. And then subsequently, while at San Remi, he painted the Starry Sky, the Starry Night, which you see here in 1889. Now, this is not a naturalistic landscape. This is not a scene that he observed and painted, but one that he synthesized in part by looking out the window of his cell in the asylum. And from there, one would see this uh, undulating line of mountains in the distance. But there was no town in view there. So the town has been inserted. Moreover, it seems that this cypress tree, something he sketched elsewhere in the area, uh, that has been inserted as well. Um, and whatever stars might have been in the sky at the time, he's greatly exaggerated their, their luminosity. Uh, so what we have is a landscape that was, that was put together. Um, you, you'll notice that most of the painting is blue, of course. You, the author of your text wants to make this out to be an expression of melancholy. I would disagree with that. Let me refer to the text where it said that um, together with the turbulent brushstrokes, the color suggests a quiet but pervasive depression. Well, one could argue conversely that uh, in giving color and giving luminosity to the night sky and conveying the energy of what looks like a comet uh, twirling through the image, that he's, um, he's exalting the sky and painting it with um, with enthusiasm and, and even implying something positive and uh, thrilling about seeing the sky, seeing nature at night. Um, the 
the blue is, is contrasted by goldish or orangish colors, especially in the Crescent Mountain. And then, then you'll notice that the cypress tree is a dark green, but it has reddish strokes running through it. So in a subtle way, there is a complementary contrast going on there. Now, both cypress tree, which is a, a, a natural form, and the church steeple break through the horizon line into the sky. Let me add here about the church. This is not the, the type of church building that one would see in the south of France. And the church nearby, the asylum where he lived, had a, had a dome. Uh, it seems to be a memory of the steep, um, of, the, of the, the steeply pitched roofs and steeples of the churches of his Dutch homeland, where his father uh, had been a minister serving at various churches. Uh, so this is another um, imagined uh, synthetic aspect of the painting. The fact that both forms, both human made and man and, and uh, natural, reach through the horizon of the sky, it seems to me suggests uh, aspiration. It suggests a connection uh, felt or um, um, or desired between um, between between earth and, and heaven. Um, indeed, Van Gogh may have been thinking about death. He was writing such things in letters at the time, and he opined that perhaps we go to, uh, perhaps we, we, we die to go to a star, that our life continues on a star. Um, and yet this is um, not necessarily a melancholy or negative uh, idea, but um, in containing a, an idea of, 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 of life continuing, uh, an afterlife, um, uh, I think a, 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 um, it's, it's an idea of, of, of it has positive implications that, that suggest interest in uh, what might be out there that, um, that our lives might connect with. Again, an example of expressive naturalism, where um, the scene looks more or less plausible, but clearly here, many things have been exaggerated, move, the implications of movement, the color is greatly intensified in order to express uh, symbolic content. All right, the other painter we're going to talk about is Gauguin, Paul Gauguin, um, whose life inter interconnects with Gauguin's and interesting, uh, Van Gogh's in interesting ways, which I'll get to. Uh, he lived between 1848 and 1903, certainly a longer life. And um, his early years are quite interesting because he spent several of them in Peru. Um, and when he came back to France then, um, he um, was, was schooled and spent a couple of years in the Navy. Uh, this made him aware of the wider world. And then uh, through a wealthy uh, friend, he got a job as a stockbroker uh, and made a lot of money. He was a uh, successful uh, businessman for a number of years. This allowed him to collect paintings, to meet painters, and to um, try his hand at painting himself as a kind of amateur artist, a Sunday painter. Uh, and this would have been an image that he did during that time. The date's from 1875. It's called um, the Seine uh, at the Pont de Jena. This is a bridge that's now well within the city of Paris. Um, a winter scene, obviously, and it's very much in keeping with Impressionism in the um, uh, uh, in the, the, the choice of subject, um, that is a, um, a, a landscape, a contemporary scene on the periphery of Paris in the visible brushwork. Uh, and it probably was painted on plein air, painted in the outdoors before the motif. Uh, Gauguin exhibited uh, at the last five Impressionist exhibitions. And initially he would have done so as a part-time artist. Uh, but then in 1882, there was a crash of the stock market in Paris, and he was, he was out of work. And he began to think about um, uh, embarking on a career as an artist. Now, this was difficult to do because he was married, he had five children, but uh, it wasn't long before his wife realized they could not depend on him for support, and she returned to Denmark. She was from Denmark, and uh, was supported there by her family. Um, and Gauguin um, then um, 
pursued uh, with difficulty, uh, living a kind of hand to mouth existence, getting help where he could, I pursued a career as a painter. Uh, now, one of the places where artists went to in, in, uh, in France to paint was Brittany. And Brittany is the part of France that sticks furthest out into the Atlantic Ocean. It was the, um, the, the least developed part of France. Um, little industry out there, um, mostly people living a traditional existence, farming, fishing. Uh, their their um, piety was, um, was famously um, rather simplistic, naive, one might say. Um, and artists could live there cheaply. It was inexpensive. And so at places like pont Avon and Le Poldu, uh, these are Breton villages, uh, groups of artists congregated. Uh, it was there that Gauguin painted in 1888 this work, which is entitled Vision After the Sun. And you'll notice that we see Breton women wearing their distinctive lace caps. Uh, and among them, here to the right, is a looks like a priest or a monk. Uh, the haircut looks like that of a monk. Uh, a kind of circular banded hair, the rest cut off. Uh, but interestingly, he has the profile of Gauguin himself with his distinctive kind of bent nose. Um, he's looking prayerfully down. And what's going on here, it seems, as the women, the title suggests, the women are saying a vision of Jacob wrestling with the archangel. This is an Old Testament story after having heard about that in a, uh, a church sermon. Uh, most of them uh, are, have their hands held in prayer. They look down. One of them looks into the distance and directs our attention there. Now, we clearly see here a very different kind of painting than that first Impressionist work by the hand I showed you. And, and this is partly explained by statements that Gauguin made in complaining about the limitations of Impressionism. What he said is this, the Impressionists study color exclusively insofar as the decorative effect, but without freedom, retaining the shackles of verisimilitude or lifelikeness. Uh, for them, the dream landscape created from many different entities does not exist. They heed only the eye and they neglect the mysterious centers of thought, so falling into merely scientific reasoning. They are the, they are the officials of tomorrow as bad as the officials of today. Well, officials would want to regulate things. They would want to set, um, set rules, set guidelines. And Gauguin indicates by this, he's interested in what lies beyond verisimilitude. Uh, he's interested in mysterious centers of thought that lies within people that, that is connected with ideas and emotions. And he's perfectly willing, as you see here, to deviate from plausibility in order to suggest mystery. Um, so, um, in the hats of the women, in the representation of the women, uh, you can see that he's very, very greatly simplified things. And there's rather little modeling. Um, modeling, uh, that is, the use of light and shadow to suggest three-dimensionality, the roundness of a form. This is something that he began to use very selectively and often not at all. Uh, the ha hats are, are, particularly here on the left-hand side, the aprons, they're boldly outlined in, um, in dark contours. Um, this thing in the center is an apple tree that divides uh, the foreground from the background where we see the, 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 uh, what they envision taking place, what exists uh, presumably in their minds and not in reality. Uh, and th this, this imaginative realm is given a blood red ground on which the wrestlers appear. They too are outlined in, in dark contours and then filled in, particularly the wings, with solid colors, which suggests perhaps on, in Gauguin's part as well, the influence of Japanese prints. Now, he was working in the company of another artist uh, at this time, and really um, uh, absorbing that man's ideas and developing them for himself. Um, a, a critic labeled this style that was developed by Bernard and Gauguin as Cloisonism. 
Cloisonism. So let me tell you where that comes from. Well, here on the right-hand side, these are medieval cloisonné objects. And cloisonné is a uh, metalworking technique whereby strips of metal are soldered together to form little cells or chambers. You can see them here, which are then filled in with enamel paste, and enamel hardens up. And notice that the enamel uh, appears uh, as bright color, particularly red, uh, also blues. Uh, and um, there is little gradation, really, uh, no, nothing like shading within those cells. Um, these are uh, from about the sixth century, and they are uh, ornaments that would be used to hold a cape around the shoulders of a, uh, a chieftain. And here's uh, another example. We're looking here now at medieval stained glass, where uh, leading forms um, contours, thin uh, bands of metal, which hold the glass in place. Uh, there are details painted, say, for, for example, in the area of the head, but no real modeling. I think I have another example here. Again, medieval stained glass, some details painted on here to replicate or to represent um, a pattern of leaves. But otherwise, we see rich colors, deep, intense colors uh, within uh, firm contour lines made, of course, of the metal. So you can see the similarity between these um, medieval uh, decorative objects, medieval images, and this style developed by uh, Emile Bernard, but, but in the example we're looking at by Paul Gauguin, cloisonism is the name of the style, a variant of post-impressionism. Now, um, subsequently to painting, um, uh, the vision after the sermon, Gauguin went to live with Van Gogh in Arles for nine weeks. And this is a curious uh, and fascinating episode in the history of art. Nine weeks, they argued, uh, it seems, almost nonstop about all kinds of things. And one of the uh, issues they argue about is particularly interesting, um, and I think pertinent for our discussion here. Uh, Gauguin uh, encouraged Van Gogh to paint from memory, not to rely on a model on a subject that was there in front of his eyes, that would be, of course, a naturalistic approach to painting, to replicate what you see in front of you, although you might intensify aspects of it. Um, instead, Gauguin wanted uh, Van Gogh to follow his example and draw on his memory to, to make something up, uh, drawn from his imagination. And while Van Gogh tried this, uh, this method was uh, was really uncongenial for him. Uh, and uh, although in the starry night, we see him putting together there at a later point in time, a landscape which he did not see altogether, but in, in large part imagined. So, uh, it, you know, it did work a, a, a bit for him, a few examples, but, but, but largely he found it um, frustrating. Uh, whereas, um, um, Gauguin would, would continue this method throughout his, his uh, painting career. Um, after all these arguments, then um, uh, for nine weeks time, Gauguin made noise about leaving. And, uh, and this seems to have been one of the factors that pushed uh, Van Gogh toward an emotional collapse and the, the mutilation of his ear. Well, uh, pretty quickly, uh, Gauguin began to talk about leaving France and Western civilization altogether. He fashioned himself as a savage who acted upon his, his impulses, into his intuitions. He didn't want to follow rules. And so he thought the place to do this was to go to the South Pacific. Uh, he would leave the decadence, the materialism of Western civilization behind, and he imagined that he might find a kind of pure, untouched paradise there. Uh, and so, in, in sum, he went twice to the South Pacific. He actually died there eventually. He was there between 1891 and 1893. He returned to Paris for two years and then went back in 1895 and lived until 18, excuse me, 1903 in, um, uh, 
uh, in Tahiti, and then eventually the Marquesas Islands, which are about a thousand miles from Tahiti, both in the South Pacific. Now, having returned to Paris, he painted this work, which you see on the screen, called The Day of the God. It dates from 1895. So, um, you know, this is a perfect example of drawing on your imagination. He wasn't in Tahiti at all when he painted this. He was drawing on memories of it. Now, he may have had some sketches uh, that he incorporated, but um, the Day of the God, uh, as indicated by the title, seems to be a time when feasting takes place, when music is played, when dancing is going on. That's all here in the background. And we see here a sequence of figures in the foreground that suggests perhaps birth, growth, and death. Uh, that is the, 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 the arc of human life. Um, the colors, you can see, are highly subjective. This is a, a pool of water, presumably in the foreground, into which the woman sticks her lower legs um, and causes a, a rippling pattern to form. But you'll notice that the different uh, areas of the water bordered by ripples are given um, their own brightly colors, bright colors, such as it looks like a, um, a jigsaw puzzle. These look like puzzle pieces that have been fitted together, uh, colored intensely different from one another. Uh, they're defined by bold contour lines, as you might see elsewhere in the painting. Notice the, the, the sand here of this beach uh, site is pink, and other extreme color, other strong colors appear in the background. Now, all this takes place under a, um, a religious idol. Um, having returned then to Tahiti, uh, then uh, Gauguin was at a particularly low state in his life. Uh, he was sick, he was, his money had just about run out. He had learned that his favorite child uh, had died. And so he, um, he decided to paint a kind of last will and testament, a last big work uh, that might represent his ideas, his, um, his um, mental state at the time, and, um, and he would take poison and, and commit suicide. And this is the result uh, of that effort. A big painting, which is four and a half feet by 12 feet in length, and so uh, a work that makes a big statement, an ambitious work. It took him a month to paint. He said he did it without the smell of the studio. By that he means that he, he, um, he did not follow the the, um, um, the practices of Western art, uh, traditional, conventional Western art, by making lots of studies and uh, uh, drawing individual figures and gradually putting this together. But rather, he claimed he responded to impulse, to uh, inspiration, and he painted it in one passionate effort. Um, well, it's entitled, Where Do We Come From? Who Are We? And Where Are We Going? And those words are written in French here in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, so these are these are big questions. These are questions that uh, humans have have always pondered, uh, as, as far as we know. Where do we come from? What are we doing here? Where are we going? These are questions that are ultimately, of course, unanswerable. And uh, Gauguin is not here suggesting uh, firm, clear answers, but uh, simply raising the questions. Um, and so if we look at the motifs, the figural motifs and the other uh, items present, what's suggested is a number of things. Well, one, the, um, the stages of life. So you can see here a child watched over by a group of women on the lower right hand corner. There is a, uh, a young girl in the middle of the painting, and an old woman on the left-hand side of the painting. Uh, other figures as well. So this suggests the unfolding of life, from birth to, to growth, to middle age, to maturity, to death, decline and death. Uh, there are also an, animals scattered about. So we see a dog over here, and goose here, goose, goose or duck. Um, maybe this is a goat, there are cats, uh, another bird. Uh, so the animalian nature of human beings and our kinship with animals is suggested uh, by that, uh, by those relationships. 
the bakery in the, in the center is reaching up to grab an apple. And this has, in my mind, uh, a number of uh, possible meanings. It might suggest the eating of the fruit from the tree of knowledge, um, as described in Genesis, in the Old Testament. Um, and that, uh, according to that, that story, uh, that was the event that got Adam and Eve kicked out of the Garden of Eden and brought suffering and death and the necess necessity to work uh, into, uh, into the realm of human life, human experience. Uh, it also brought knowledge, awareness. Uh, so, uh, so all those things are suggested. Uh, and the reference to the Bible uh, reminds us then of Western religion, just as the idol back here, carved idol, as you might see in Tahiti or the Marquesas Islands, reminds us of Eastern religion. So religion, which takes various forms, is a kind of constant of human experience. The need to resort to myth, to stories, to belief, in order to answer these difficult questions. Where do we come from? Who are we? And where are we going? Notice the form of the painting and the very selective um, inconsistent use of modeling. Some figures model them, um, oh, here, for example, uh, quite extensively, uh, the arm, the details in the back. Other figures, this one over here, model not at all. It looks like light is striking this figure, but not this figure. Um, and yet the older woman next to her is, is modeled more extensively, dark side of the leg. Um, you may notice that, that the modeling of one figure does not agree with another. So he's using modeling more as a decorative feature than a way of giving realism to the painting. Uh, the painting appears both flat and two-dimensional. Uh, some areas seem just to rise up vertically and to affirm the two-dimensionality of the canvas. In other respects, there is a sense of distance. We have a mountain back here that looks far away, a body of water, and an exotic landscape. Uh, in between with a decorative pattern of tree limbs here as well and um, strong and really quite quite beautiful and exotic colors. Uh, this painting is now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts um, and um, about the suicide attempt, well, it didn't work. It just, uh, again, made himself even more sick, but he did recover and live for another few years, eventually dying in uh, the Marquesas Islands where he is buried. Uh, so in Van Gogh and Gauguin, we have two versions of post-impressionism. Uh, Both retain the strong colors, the vivid colors and the broken brushwork of, um, of impressionism, but they add something to that, and that is um, a greater emotional depth and um, a willingness to, to depart from naturalism, from plausibility, in order to, to convey emotions and ideas. And for, of course, Gauguin does that um, draw on, on his imagination uh, more greatly than Van Gogh does. And in fact, uh, he, he is seen as the father of symbolism, an art movement that has its origins in the 1880s and then develops in the subsequent decades before and after 1900, in which, um, um, well, it, this is really a new kind of symbolism. It's not uh, symbolism that depends on conventional meanings, you know, red or roses or love or the, the, the a white dove is the trinity. Th those are, uh, that's, that's an earlier kind of symbolism um, that makes use of the conventional language that most viewers would hold in common. Uh, for late 19th century symbolism, it's really, the meanings are personal. They arise out of the imagination of the painter, as we can see here in this late work of Gauguin's. Uh, 